How many coat hangers can hold my weight? One coat hanger. Ah! Two coat hangers. Oh! Five coat hangers. Oh! Six coat hangers. Oh! 10 coat hangers. Oh! 17 coat hangers. Oh! 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 20. Oh, no way. It's making noises. It's actually holding me. Let's, oh, 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 oh they're snapping one by one. I can't, oh, 23. Oh, that's it. No way. Oh, one broke. This is like actually pretty sturdy. Oh. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Money Me, the series that's going to turn your pricing woes into pricing woes. We're excited to have our very first guest on this series. Chat Klusman on today to share some mind-blowing insights on how Ash and Dale prices projects. Uh, but before we jump into things, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on content just like this um, to help you price your projects like a boss instead of that usual guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar approach. <laughs> so, uh, Chat, thanks again for taking some time out and joining us on uh, this weird little show called Money Me. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Was that opening some sort of allegory about product design? I think we might <laughs> we might we might find our way to that here. Maybe it's about pricing design, even if we uh, we go that far down it. But uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with the obligatory, like way over the top introduction of who you are to set the bar ridiculously high, uh, and where all our viewers will think that you have every answer to every question they they've ever had. Does that sound good? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if I can answer that question. Give it a go. Uh, You're hard hitting right from the top. Uh, in the design world, I am, I am what is affectionately known as an old. Uh, I've been around the block for, for a good while. Uh, I, I have my own agency, but I took a long road to it. So, you know, I, I think that's probably true for a great many uh, designer agency owners. I came out of art school. Well, I guess, you know, before even art school, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I went to school studying physics and electrical engineering. Uh, and then I switched to computer science. And then I really was in the lab, computer lab, making like text games. It's early 90s, they were called MUDs, multi-user Dungeons and Dragons. They were the precursor to MMOs. Um, I was having so much fun there, I wasn't doing my coursework. Realized I was really attracted to the act of creation, and I felt like I could create faster in a different medium. So I dropped out of uh, computer science. I dropped out of college. Went to art school. Uh, got out of art school. Uh, landed my first job at an agency. Did ten years of the agency world. Uh, then I knew I wanted to go out on my own. So I tried freelancing. Uh, that was a very up and down road. Maybe we'll come back to that in a bit, but. Uh, I landed a startup client, and that startup client became my 800-pound gorilla client. Uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I went to work for them, uh, where I was the head of the marketing creative for almost another 10 years. It was nine years. Uh, then I finally did strike out on my own again, freelance for a while, had a nice lifestyle business, walking my daughter to school, picking her up afterwards, walking home. Uh, it was great, um, probably wasn't making enough money to put them through college doing that. Uh, pandemic hit and we decided to start an agency. What better time to start an agency than in the middle of a pandemic when everything is shut down? Yeah, that was yeah. pretty much when we did too. So like that was, that's really the best time to start. <laughs> we are all I smart think. people. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. We're just the waiting smartest. for that pandemic moment to open the doors yeah. for us. Uh, so. Thank you so much for that that intro. Um, and if I'm understanding correctly, like you left the computer science world for the money uh, in the creative world, right? That's usually why most of us make that that choice. Yeah, yeah. In uh, in '93, my buddy 1993 context before most people that are probably watching this were born. Uh, my buddy dropped out of college to go to work for Apple. Uh, about three or four stock splits ago. Um, he vested there and then after four years jumped over to Microsoft, again, about three or four stock splits ago. Um, pretty sure he's driving a Lamborghini these days. Uh, I am not, but that that's quite all right. Yeah, I, I dropped out. I said, you know what? That doesn't sound appealing to me. I am going to go uh, go to graphic design school and that is clearly the way. Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, a perfect, uh, like triage into a creative, uh, show about money is, uh, 
like avoid avoid those Apple and Microsoft uh, stock splits as, as best you can. So not financial advice. We're not financial advisors, but uh, uh, with that, like let's dive right in. Uh, we, we kind of uh, going back to the beginning with the cold open. Uh, first and foremost, uh, just hitting on your thoughts on the cold open beyond it being the uh, the old product design allegory. I think that might be true. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that, of that cold open. <laughs> it looked like a lot of fun. It looked like the sort of thing I would have done in my 20s. Uh, it looks like the sort of thing my, my back and joints would not appreciate me trying now. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar to my first thought. Is there thought. a story behind that? Yeah. I, we don't know. We, we, we just find these random cold opens, and we, if, if they make us laugh, we'll just throw them in there <laughs> and just kind of see what... Uh, our guest thoughts are on things, so don't necessarily know what the story is. It's a different one each time. Yeah. It's a different one each time. Just weird and random to see if we can start it rolling. For me, it felt very much like uh, the process of me as a primarily as a creative working through some JavaScript code this morning uh, felt a lot like trying to figure out uh, a lot of failure uh, is is basically what it made me think of. yeah, I think most creatives trying to work their way through JavaScript code. Most creatives who aren't developers. Developers are also creatives. Um, yeah. If you're a designer and you're trying to do JavaScript, it's probably going to not go great. It's probably going to feel a lot like the, the, the clothes hangers experience. Um, <laughs> Unless you're one of those really special designers that's actually good at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I cannot make that claim. Things. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, co- I I play a developer on TV sometimes, but it is fun. I do actually like the creative aspect of it, uh, but there's a lot more code hangers breaking during that process than there might be in, like, Figma or something. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's jump in actually into some money, like, uh, questions here since this is a series about talking about pricing. Um, so, chat uh, for Ash and Dale, with there being so many pricing options and structures out there, like, you know, hourly or whatever project based. How do you guys go about charging for your, uh, your projects? Yeah. Um, so probably good to talk about our audience. Our, our clients are early stage startups. That's anywhere from seed funding, uh, sometimes even pre-seed, but anywhere from, from let's say friends and family funding up through about series C. Uh, by that time they've grown to a certain size where they're able to, staff a multi-person creative team in-house. That's usually where we start to wind down a little bit or just switch how we collaborate, but we're not as fully engaged. We're not the entire creative team for that startup anymore. Uh, So because we know we're dealing with cash-strapped small companies, um, we had to find a pricing model that was going to fit with that. Uh, I had been on the agency side. I had been on the in-house at a startup side. Uh, And fundamentally, that wasn't normally working. It tends to be a lot of project-based stuff. We decided to go with a blended hourly rate. Uh, It just removes a lot of the friction of the conversation. So uh, we work the same way our startup clients do. We're in their their Slack channels. We're using Slack Connect. Uh, We're using the same project management tools. We do weekly stand-ups with them. Uh, Startups are usually, they don't have a hard deadline for anything. Everything is, I need that as soon as possible. I need these 12 things as soon as possible. Great. Let's get on a call. We're going to stack rank them in order. We're going to work them in the order that we stack rank them in from your number one priority down the line, right? Uh, and by having a single blended rate where everything is just, uh, and, you know, all we have to do is talk about hours. Okay, that, that's probably four or five hours for that. That's probably 10 to 12 hours over there. This larger piece, that, that might be 30 or 40 hours, right? And they have a sense of that. We send out a weekly report every Monday to all of our clients with a breakdown of their time because everybody's tracking their time. And uh, we use an app called Toggle. Everyone tracks their time and codes it. We, we built out a, a whole system to code uh, projects. So everybody's putting that in in real time and that lets us send out those weekly reports so they're all tracking their stuff. And that way we just, the blended rate works really smoothly. We, we have almost no friction or discussions about cost when we're working on our work on our day-to-day stuff. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so that, that's really great, uh, interesting to hear, especially for this audience, because um, Matt and I had previously worked a lot with like, especially early, early, like, um, you know, pre series A, maybe angel funding, maybe nothing at all. And while we really loved working with them, the, oh, the challenge always was with them was that 
it's hard to work with cash strapped uh, startups. Um, and so how did you how did you get paid for your, your work? So it was interesting that you were able to describe this like um, blended approach and maybe something that we if we had had your, this wisdom or this series existed for us, we could have considered this as an option. Yeah, and it's like design where you have to know the rules and yet before you know when to break the rules too, right? So there's, there's a couple of other things that we'll do. Um, larger projects, you typically have to bound them. So like if somebody, if we're doing a branding project or if we're doing a website, uh, we'll typically do a proposal for those because you you need to go in having a sense of what your total cost is going to be when it's going to be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, same thing with custom photography and custom video. There's just a lot of moving parts. I can't do a blended hourly rate when there's equipment costs, there's um, studio rentals, there's cast and crew, there's you know props and, and a dozen other things to account for. So we'll do proposals for those as well. Um, but yeah, for, for most things, we're going to get away with a blended rate and it works really well. And does it, does it usually make sense to them, you know, when you're kind of like, this is, this is more of a project basis, probably giving them some description like you just gave us, like, are they pretty amenable and kind of get why that doesn't fit the, the blended rate, um, kind of model? Like sometimes there's this, a little bit of a barrier, regardless of your approach of like, well, your client has to sort of get it as much as it makes sense to you from a delivery perspective. Yeah, I, it does. It, I think it's probably really helpful for us that they don't come to us to have us do pitch decks and collateral for three years and then ask for a, a, you know, a redesign or a rebrand. They're coming to us usually in, for the big project first. They're coming to us to, to do their branding work or they're coming to us to do their website or both a lot of times. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the pricing model up front. We'll give them a proposal for that work. Uh, but we, we always pitch them on the, on the regular hourly model because we don't want the normal, you know, feast and famine that agencies have where they're going to do the big projects and then they're out, right? So we want to do the big project, but then we want to be their creative team, their in-house creative team. Uh, and we have this pitch for this, which works really well, which is, hey, you know, you're, their normal route, they're going to hire a single designer. They're going to be a five-person marketing department. They're going to hire a designer. And now all of their marketing tactics go through that one person's skill set. And we tell them, hey, spend that, spend one or two or three headcount with us, depending on where they're at in their, in their business. Uh, and instead of having that one skill set, you have all of the creative skill sets you could ever need. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's probably too, you've usually built that trust part uh, in the big project world, right? Like, uh, that, that probably helps too. They're like, you're not price gouging us. You're trying to come up with an actual good pricing solution. Like a lot of that's probably sort of already established, even if it's not directly spoken about. Is that kind of true? Some We have a similar kind of thing where it's like, if you trusted us with this big project, they might even be asking for that type of thing. Yeah, it is. And sometimes if it's a, if it's a cold connection versus say a referral, we might even recommend, hey, you know, why don't you try a couple of small projects first? Why don't you get a feel for how we operate? And then we'll do the big one, right? You might have some, because a lot of times they have some immediate needs too that are, that are separate from we need to launch a new brand in, in a quarter. Yep, that's great. And there's always the other side too of, you know, we're in service-based businesses. You mentioned a little bit about avoiding that feast or famine uh, kind of traditional big project and then we're out kind of role, but we obviously, our goal is to make more money than we're spending, especially in a service business, a little bit different than the startup world that a lot of us work with. But like, how do you know you're charging enough for your projects? Is there a margin, you know, region you're shooting for when you're setting your blended rate or you're setting your project uh, scope? <laughs> I, I don't want to be too flippant about this, but if I'm bringing it, if I, if I look at my bank account and I have more coming in than going out, that, that's, that's a good way. Uh -huh. No, look, we, uh, we, we have our blended rate uh, and we know what our, what our uh, employee salaries are, right? And we, and we know what uh, our non-billable costs are, right? So we have admin staff that is not billable that we have to cover the cost for out of the other work we do. We have all of our software and hardware costs that we have to cover. Um, you know, we get good, get, get some basic business skills if you're gonna try to run an agency or a freelance business. 
right? Uh, if you're going to purchase a laptop, you're typically um, depreciating that over a, over a three-year schedule, right? Uh, you can essentially break up the cost over that three years as well. Uh, it's it's not too difficult if you just take a take a few hours or take a day or two to figure out how to account for your for your costs for and for what's coming in and what's going out. Um, one of the things we did early on that was super helpful was we knew we wanted to grow, so we modeled out what our agency was going to look like at different sizes, right? Uh, you know, I've I've had the the benefit of experience, so I know you know, roughly what the makeup is of a company, of a 25 person agency, what the makeup is of a 50 person agency. Uh, and from there, extrapolating out, you know, a 100 person agency. Um, as we're looking at what those additional roles were gonna be, those senior roles that are more expensive, those non-billable roles, the extra uh, hardware and software costs, all that, and I realized we weren't going to be profitable. We were gonna lose money at the, at the rate we were charging at the time. Uh, so we raised our rates. Yeah, that, it's, it's a great exercise. We've done some probably like watered down versions of that, Hein, but it, it is almost interesting to just be like, even if it's not maybe the driving force of what we're after, at least, what would this look like at 25 people? Just out of curiosity, it almost seems helpful to sort of just get an eye on that hypothetical, if nothing else. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. And I think that's something that, uh, Almost immediately after this conversation, I feel like I'm just going to go and mess around with that to kind of see what that would look like for, for Huck fans, even though, like, I think you, we've just, we've talked about it where, you know, we, it's not necessarily our intention to scale by adding bodies. So, but at the same time, it still would be an interesting exercise because then that would kind of think of, help us think about, like, can we charge more or, you know, if things go a certain way, then maybe we can pay ourselves more even and maybe get that Lamborghini at some point. Doubt it, but maybe. <laughs> um, or or Rivian, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's different layers. There's a Rivian column. There's a Lamborghini column. It's <laughs> <spreadsheet. laughs> um, Yeah. So this next question is uh, less about like kind of pricing strategies, but more kind of like a mindset kind of question. But as creatives, I think uh, just kind of speak, I maybe I'm wrong here, but I think as a creative, we've all kind of had the feel bad moment of telling clients that the price, giving them the price of a, a project or something like that. Um, in your opinion, like, why do you think it is so hard for creatives to price their projects or price their work? Left brain, right brain split, creative versus analytical, um, introvert versus extrovert, take, take your pick, right? Um, I don't think m most people choose design as a profession uh, because they want to start a company or be a business, business person, right? It's a, it's a different mindset. Uh, I do think that one of the best things that younger designers can do, uh, or older designers who haven't done it yet, is get good at business. Um, you know, one of the first questions I ask a designer when I'm interviewing them is, what is design? It seems like a really simple question, right? We have whole industries around this. But you get a variety of answers. Uh, about, you know, a third of people will tell me it's about communication, right? And I'm like, well, okay, what about product design? What about furniture design? Uh, are those communicate those aren't necessarily communications right they're, they're solving they're, they're, they're doing different things about one third of people tell me it's about making things look good and uh, I don't want to hurt any designers feelings watching this but no no sometimes you're making something look ugly on purpose it just depends you know the supermarket uh, flyer is always a great example right it does it's not high design it doesn't look like a fashion magazine that for a reason when you open that up, that thing goes out to people of every income level. And when they open it up, it needs to speak to them. They need to feel like they can afford to buy the things that are in there, right? So it's, it looks cheap by design. It's not about looking good. What it is doing is it's solving a business problem. That's what design is. Design is solving problems, right? You're solving problems in a visual space a lot of times or in a product space, but you're solving business problems. And so learning the language of business and learning about business is going to give you a lot more confidence when you're speaking to your clients who are concerned about their business, right? They're coming to you because you're the, the expert at what you do, but they need to know that it's going to help their business. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, and so on the pricing side of things, you know, that's, I don't recommend doing what I did, but what I did was before I, I started freelancing 20 years ago, I talked about that. Uh, I knew I wanted to start my own business then. 
and I knew I sucked at the business side of things. I was afraid to price things out. I was afraid to have those conversations. I actually went and got a sales job. Uh, and that is, you know, if you're a designer, that can be a soul sucking experience, right? That, that mentally and emotionally drained me daily, but I got good at it. Uh, you know, I did sales at Dell, Dell as a, in Austin, Texas or in Round Rock, which is like a suburb of Austin. Uh, sorry, Round Rock people. It is. Um, I have a few friends that would uh, know exactly what that aside was for. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I did, did I did sales at Dell and they had sales. They had these things called spiffs and spiffs are bonuses. So you sell the most of this thing and you get a spiff. You sell the most of that thing and you get a spiff. Right. And and that was a lot of money. The biggest one was three grand and it was up for grabs every month. And I I got it every month because I figured out how to game the system. I figured out how to talk to the clients and get what I needed out of that exchange while giving them what they needed out of it. Right. And I did that job for a year. I got promoted and I, I ended up doing it for another year. And then they wanted to give me a team and make me a sales leader. And I went, oh, shit, this is becoming a career. I quit. Uh, <laughs> and I went and started, started my own freelance business. And it was, you know, that was still very rocky. I, I had gotten good at sales, but I hadn't let yet learned other aspects of it. Like uh, I still try to be everything to everyone and take all clients and all segments versus finding a niche. Well, why would you want a niche? That's going to limit your clients. Finding a niche really helps us optimize our business and find clients. Um, so I've probably gone off the reservation from, from this, but I think when you're talking about uh, for getting good at pricing, it's something that designers need to confront head on, uh, whether it's comfortable or not, especially because it's probably not comfortable, whether that's, you know, getting a business coach, finding a mentor, auditing a class, um, or taking a sales job. I don't recommend it, right? It's, you, you have options, you have ways that you can go to, to try to improve that skill. Take a, take a debate class, right? You have to get up there and argue. You will specifically have to argue against what you personally believe. And you're going to have to use, you know, tactics of debate to do that. And you're going to get good at arguing your case. And the other thing is just, you know, figure out what you need to live, figure out what you need to be whole, because then, then you have a floor that you know you can't go below. Uh, if somebody's like, oh, well, take this or, or you don't get the work. No, I'm not going to work for what's essentially negative income for me. The opportunity cost of that, because what if I get, you know, of missing out on something that would pay me what I need is, is just terrible. So figure out what you need and be confident about that. I love that. That last part, like opportunity cost is one of the, for me personally, is like one of the hardest things, especially when you're starting out as a freelancer or a super small agency or whatever. Like when you say yes to something, you're no longer available uh, for something else, whatever that might be. And, you know, when you are in that mode of just saying yes to everything, it's really hard to like, consume that information you might you might read a social media post that just says that in a nice neat basket it's like sure but i could really use 500 dollars right now uh, but you can sell yourself short like really easily uh, early on even if you're just beginning i love that just sort of establishing the reality of your life <laughs> and at least holding being confident about the fact that you need a thousand dollars and that 500 is uh more valuable than it sounds like also figure out, you know, want versus need as well, right? Like there may be certain companies or industries that you want to work with. Uh, and so there the opportunity cost might flip around a little bit. Maybe you're willing to take a lower rate, even if it causes you some pain to get an in with that industry, right? But you're doing it for a very specific reason. You're not compromising just because somebody beat you over the head with price. You're compromising it because you know, you want to make band posters, you know, show posters, and that's that's not a highly profitable industry to begin with. Uh, and you want the you want the in. Uh, and by the way, if you if your if your audience doesn't know, basically you get paid between somewhere between zero and peanuts to design a gig poster, and then what you gain is the ability to sell gig posters. Right? You might be able to sell sell them at the if you create the art, you might be able to sell shirts and posters at the show, and you might be able to sell them on your website. Um, 
it is a business opportunity. It is not an upfront payment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we both have ties to the music industry in a couple of different ways ourselves. So definitely not the uh, lucrative uh, pathway uh, to money is working with musicians, but it, it can be really fun. <laughs> um, just uh, we want to be respectful of your time. So kind of rounding out this little section focusing on money we've talked a lot about like setting the prices from like where you sort of sit it's almost like the meeting yourself where you are on like how much you need to make for things part but we'd probably be remiss to not ask how you go about just demonstrating value up front like let's say it's a colder lead right where you haven't already done a project they, they sort of know your value or have experienced it but you're pitching that that project from a cold, uh, you know, a cold to warm lead. They haven't worked with you before. That gets into the other side of this pricing thing. Obviously, we talked about debating the value. What's kind of in that debate for you or things that you've maybe learned over the years that help make that a, an easier conversation for both sides, maybe? So I think the thing that makes it, the, the, the single biggest thing that makes it easier is, again, learning that language of business, learning what is driving your client or your potential client and what they need to get out of the relationship, right? So uh, we work with marketing teams. Uh, first thing I want you want to do is understand uh, marketing terms, right? They have uh, KPIs, key performance uh, indicators. Uh, I think it's indicators. I don't know. Key performances, right? They, they have goals that they have to hit. That, that means they might have to get a certain number of leads in their marketing pipeline for sales to talk to, they might need to get a, they might have um, higher level goals from that, like to get those leads. They need to drive a certain amount of traffic to their website, right? So finding out what success looks like for your client is sort of the first goal, right? Uh, maybe you're in you're in branding, maybe you're doing maybe you're in um, CPG, uh, and you're you're designing uh, packaging for for uh, a grocery store item, right? Uh, in that situation, they're, they're still going to have KPIs they have to, to meet, right? They're going to have competition they need to stand out against. They're going to have certain targets they need to hit in order to uh, be profitable on their, on their product line. Maybe they have to have, they probably have certain targets they have to hit just to get into those chains, into those retail stores. Uh, and if they don't continue to hit them, they get removed from the shelves, right? So being able to ask those questions and to know that information and to be, be a partner with them and, to ha and let them know that you're going to help them reach those targets. You're not just going to design the milk carton, right? You're, you're designing it with intent to help them reach their business goals. That's a really big part of the conversation. The other thing too is like, we're really fortunate. We're full service uh, creative for marketing teams. Uh, a little bit for the product teams too, but we're mostly focused on the marketing side. Uh, and when I say full service creative, we're going a little bit, it's probably creative plus. Right, so we have we're doing design and animation and web and, and we're doing all of these other, other things. But along with that, uh, if we're building the websites, we also need to be able to metric the websites, right? So we have uh, data and marketing automation as part of our services. So we're able to go in and we're able to do HubSpot, we're able to do uh, Google Analytics, we're able to do Google Tag Manager, we're able to, use, to do AdWords and ad buys, right? And that means that we're able to metric our work. Uh, and even if we weren't the ones, even if you're not able to do all those things, you're not able to be the one metricing your work, uh, somebody over there at the company is, and you can work with them so that you're looking at the data with them. Be a part of the process. Uh, and so when we're dividing, you know, I tell my clients when we're building, like, say, a new web page or, or, or a campaign, you're making your best guesses on what's going to work. We're making our best guesses on what's going to work. This is a starting point, right? Nothing static on the web. We're going to get that live. And then what we should be doing is looking at the data and A-B testing. We should be testing something against it and gathering more data, finding out what does work, what doesn't work, building our knowledge base about your audience and your product and, and what's going what's gonna to bridge the gap between the two. Um, and when you start talking about that, you see, you're going to build a lot of confidence with them. Sometimes they're not even thinking that far ahead or they're not thinking, but they're just like, I got to get this page live and I, and I really hope it works because I got to get traffic. I got to get signups. And now you're starting to talk about this bigger picture and understanding their goals, and you're helping them. Now you're a lifeline. Now you're a valuable resource. Now you're not just uh, you're not just a cogs. You're not an expense. Yeah, yeah. I think that ties back a lot too to what you were saying about like 
the importance of niching down because then when you're able to niche then you can probably have these more uh intimate conversations i'll call them where like you under you can talk in their language you can speak in their vernacular and then you can create that sense of confidence of like oh these people know what they're talking about they understand me like that's exactly not... right Awesome. Yeah. So, like, I mean, we we're gonna move on to our our next sec uh, our next segment here, which is called Nugs. Even though everything that you've been providing has been just nugs of wisdom uh, that I know, like Matt and I will be at the very least taking away from from this. So, uh, what we want to do just finish up with a couple questions around like uh, tips and tricks. So, my first question for you on the Nugs here is like, do you have any tips on how to handle those always fun pricing conversations with clients? Uh, yeah, I kind of feel like. That's a lot of what we were talking about earlier, right? So, um, but I guess with a few extra things, I, I, I never have the price conversation first. It has to be contextualized, right? Uh, people are like, well, how much, is it, how much does a web site cost? How much does a brand cost? And how much does a Kia cost? How much does a, does a Maserati cost, right? Like there's, we need to have a conversation about goals and objectives and about how we want to tackle those because those are the things that are going to affect price. And people are like, well, I just need to know a price. Okay, um, you're going to be a bad client probably because you're not thinking about this the same way that we are. You're, you're not looking for a partner. You're looking for uh, the cheapest price you can get. And you know, I had one of the, we just went through the sales process with one of those clients and we, we held our line because, well, well thankfully I've, I've had the experience of having ba enough bad clients. Uh, those are their own opportunity costs. Even if they uh, agree, to, you come to an on price, uh, it's a whole other opportunity cost. A trusted partner uh, is generally going to let us do our work, right? They're going to follow our process and trust that process. Uh, and that's going to lead us to having fewer revisions and better outcomes uh, because our process is what it is for a reason, right? Uh, so when we have somebody come in, they're just hammering us on price. It's usually just a pass for us. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll be up front. Maybe... We are not the right agency for you. Uh, you know, maybe you guys need to go to Upwork, and that might be a little bit of an insult on my side, but they're not going to really catch that as an insult, and it might actually be the best route for them. Um, so always tie pricing to value and to you know needs, deliverables, and business goals and objectives. It's it's a it's a broader conversation because. We can go in, we can hire uh, freelance artists, and we can hire a bunch of people to do really specific niche things that are going to add a lot of cost to the project. And if it's a higher end project, that might make sense. Uh, but we can also work with our, with our, purely with our internal team. We can keep costs down. Uh, we can still provide really great design, uh, really great work. But maybe we're not doing, you know, we're, we're not hiring a, uh, an award winning director to shoot a commercial. Where we're working with with some more local guys that we know, right? These things greatly affect price, and so it really has to. You really have to have that conversation about what are the objectives, what are the goals, what is the budget, right? Because maybe we're actually under what your budget is, and we can do more. We can drive more value within that budget. We can take those extra dollars and we can put them to a really good use. That's that's great. I, I love that you mentioned the car thing because even if you go to like a car website, like. It'll say the price starting at, and then once you kind of customize it contextually, like, do you want these these rims or these ones? Do you want these certain like kind of like floor mats? Like, it's gonna ultimately affect the price, so you can't just go in like, like you said, with a Maserati and be like, or oh, whatever. Like, hey, I like how much of this Maserati? Like, I don't know. What do you want with it? So, I, I I really love that idea of contextualizing it. I'll tell you something else. We do when we draft our proposals, we don't just uh, put in detail what we're including. We also put in detail what we're not including, right? Because we know all of the relate all of the things that are related to the things that we're doing, and so we specifically include like, here's all the things we're doing, and then there's a disclaimer at the bottom. This does not include copywriting. You didn't talk to us about that for this project, right? This does not include uh, A/B testing for these pages. This does not include uh, post-launch support. Right. We will detail whatever is not included as well as what is included. Uh, that is that both covers our ass and makes sure that we're very clear on expectations, but it also sets the stage for, hey, well, how much are those things? I, I might I actually need that. Let's talk about that. I don't know. How, 
you know, maybe it was just overlooked during the sales call, during the sales process. All right. No, that's a really good idea. Yeah, we had a similar thing where, like, you know, so you, sometimes you can lose work just because they don't know that you can do it or it never got specifically brought up. And then the other part, especially in web and branding, I feel like there's, and I'm sure marketing as well, like they're ripe for this, like fall, like everything they can think of falls under the umbrella of like what a website is. Like some people will think marketing is included with web design uh, just because it somehow connects to it in their mind. And uh, those are very expensive add-ons to not even have a conversation about one way or the other, whether you can provide it or not. Um, I love that idea of being like, you know, either it's a chance for that upsell or like our capabilities sort of end at, you know, we don't know like G4 analytics setup or we're not copywriters. Like, you know, maybe we can bring somebody in or something, but uh, I love the idea of just listing those things out that they're probably maybe kind of thinking are included. Yeah. Uh, another thing to do is eat your, own, eat your own dog food. Right. And so what I mean by that is, if you design pitch decks, build a pitch deck for your business. If you design websites, build a website for your business. If you do branding, do branding for your business. That includes going through all the same branding exercises that you might put your client through, right? Uh, we like to do uh, Google Ventures three-hour brand sprint. We like to do um, uh, the future Christos uh, stylescapes, right? So we go through this process with our clients so when it came time to do our own branding, we made sure that we did the same process. We got the same people in the rooms and we did all that same work for ourselves. Uh, that's going to help you with your conversations with your clients too. And it's also going to help you plug holes in your own work. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge too. So just to wrap up, is there anything we didn't touch on on pricing or something you would yell at your, you know, second day of your freelancer self uh, <laughs> that you really wish you heard that we haven't talked about? Um, trying to think here, uh, we've covered a lot of things on the pricing side, but, um, you know, we're still figuring things out. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, we're, we're a little over two years old. Uh, and when it comes to, you know, hourly is great. It's much easier to calculate. Uh, when it comes to project rates, you're trying to estimate a large body of work, right? Uh, we've, we've learned how to break that down by component. Uh, but we're still learning as we go. So Q1 of this year, we had almost, the bulk of our work was actually project-based, you know, proposal-based work. So we had a lot of new client, an influx of new clients that needed branding, needed websites. Um, and we misestimated. And so we had to dive into why. And a little bit of that was um, not uh, accounting enough. We sort of rolled motion design work in to our, our our page cost, our page pay per page cost on websites, and we hadn't broken it out, and we needed to break it out uh, because different different projects just have different needs. Uh, another thing was just we didn't keep close enough, we weren't tight enough on the project management, right? So Q1 was not a good quarter for us, but we were able to, and that's going to happen. You're going to have those quarters, and you're going to, but it's an opportunity to learn, right? You know, it, it didn't kill us. We went back and we figured some stuff out from it. Those things make us stronger. They, they improved uh, our pricing model and our project management model, right? So uh, don't, don't get too disheartened or give up when, when shit goes off the rails because shit is going to go off the rails sometimes and you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to just deal with that. The other thing is um, you know, if you can find ways to smooth out the feast or famine, like I said, we're, we're the in-house team for our clients, which means that we have steady day-to-day, uh, week-to-week, month-to-month work from them. Uh, you know, try to push your clients towards retainers. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's a tough sale, but uh, one of the things we do with our retainers is uh, we don't min-max it. We, we just, it's a, it's a fixed number, right? So maybe you purchase 50 hours a month. And I tend to crack couch all of our conversations in hours. It's that one level of abstraction that just makes the conversation a little bit easier, right? They know there's a cost associated with that, but it's easier for them to talk about hours too. Uh, and that's another, you know, like I said, blended rate makes our conversation easier. That's one of the ways it makes it easier. So maybe you want 50 hours a month. Uh, what we'll do is we will set that as both the min and the, and the max. And so you spend 40 hours one month, 
well, we'll roll 10 over, and next month you have 60 available. Uh, or say you spend 60 hours in a month where you didn't have any rollover. We'll roll the 10 over, the other 10 billable into the next month. So next month you have 40 available, right? And now you have this very, very fixed cost month to month that's easy for you to balance budget for. Uh, and what I get out of that is I get very, very steady, predictable revenue, right? And, and some of them really like that, and a lot of them really, you know, others don't. And so, but the, if you can get the, even some of them on there, that gives you predictable income. That, that, that's a, that'll take a lot of the heartburn out of, out of being freelance or being a, a small two, three, four, five person agency, right? Um, save money during when, it, when it's feast or when it's famine. Uh, you want to save money during the feasts, right? Save, save food, put that food in the fridge. Um, we draw, uh, my wife and I, she's, she's the business half. She's, she's our COO. She does all the operations, all of that. Um, we draw salaries. And if we bring in more than what our salaries are, we typically let that money sit there. We want to, we want to bank, uh, you know, three to six months worth of costs, right? Uh, that seems like an extreme amount, but, uh, you know, last summer when the, uh, when the economy sort of tanked, right, it really tanked for startups in particular, uh, VC money dried up overnight. And so we had clients that were near the end of their current runway, meaning they were, they had about used up their, their seed money or their series A money, <coughs> and they needed to do another round uh, of fundraising and they couldn't get it overnight. Three of our clients went under. And uh, we took a big revenue hit from that. Uh, and we had, a, we had a large team and we didn't want to lose anybody. Uh, we literally paid one of our full-time employees to not work while we continued to pay our contractors to do work uh, because we didn't want to lose that relationship with them. And that sounds insane, but it's not. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So we, had, you know, we were able to keep everybody on board. And what that means is if you start laying people off, that, what that does to the morale and the culture within an organization, it destroys it. And if you're only a year old, that it's like a, a, a scent of failure, right? That you can't get off. Uh, and, and you want to think that, well, this bunch of creatives, designers, they'll understand. We're going to be open, honest, upfront. It's a psychological thing. And, and people have a hard time overcoming that. And people start worrying about their own job stability and safety. They're going to go look elsewhere. And then say the, when the economy does turn around, if you let people go, now you have to go through the cost, the time and the cost of replacing them, of finding new people, of, of spending all that time that you could be doing on other business things. You have to spend all that time hiring again and training them up and getting them integrated into your workflows and, and with your work, you know, working smoothly with your clients. There's all these other costs. So by having cash on hand, we were able to weather the storm and get through that. We got through the famine part, and when things picked back up, we were whole and we were right there and we were able to keep moving along. Yeah, ready Thanks. to go. Thanks for sharing yeah, thank that. You for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, that's a, yeah, a I, story everyone has some version of probably from that time period, especially if you work with startups. But in general, even the companies that weren't hit that dramatically, like everyone was thinking about it, you know, uh, even if the shoe never dropped. I don't know a lot of companies that weren't like, it might drop, you know, they were still thinking about reducing retainers or maybe not delaying that project or whatever. So I, I think a, a lot of us had some version of that uh, at that same time, uh, which is always interesting to see how how to handle that. Uh, and those, those points are great about, uh, especially that, that scent of failure thing. It's a hard sentence to say out loud, but it, it is true. All of us, like, you saw your psyche takes a long time to recover from that if you're being employed, especially because it's not you're not a part of those decisions. So it's really kind of powerful stuff. Even if you, you are part of the decisions, like you're, as the owner or, or the principal of the agency, you're probably the most affected, right? Because you are very personally connected to your own, to your own company. It's, it's kind of hard to separate. Like, and that's not like when I'm working on a branding project with a client, I, I try to get them to separate their personal self from the business, right? By focusing on on who the audience is and the audience profile and the objectives of the company and the market space and the market fit. But at the end of the day, it's your baby. You're, you're connected to it. And, and so there's always, yeah, it's going to psychologically hit you as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. I think that burn rate conver- the, the story was very uh, insightful. And I think it was probably one of the first things that we learned immediately was like having that burn rate. And I think it helped us for sure, whether like the the pandemic to start and then the last year and everything like that. And I think it's always kind of nice knowing that like maybe the kind of you said, like maybe there's some feasts, maybe there's some famine times, things shape with the, uh, the fan. Uh, but uh, you always have a little that that reserve cash to kind of like hold you through until things turn around again. But these have been all like wonderful nugs. Um, uh, we would love to kind of just like pick your brain to continue to get more of them. But uh, we'll try to start to wrap wrap things up. We really appreciate you being on the show. We're going to move into our can of shameless plugs. So for our gratitude of you spending time with us today, we want to give you the floor and, and uh, have you open up a can of shameless plug, uh, whatever you want to plug. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't have a, a lot of different things. We have, I mean, we have a lot of different services, but we just have the one plug, and that that's our that's the agency Ashendale, um, to make it real easy for folks to understand. It's actually uh, it sounds like a magical oven for us. We lean into that in our branding, right? We're the magical design agency for startups, but it's a it's actually just named after my kids, my son Ash and my daughter L E L L E. So it's Ash and L uh, dot com, and if any. Uh, you know, executives or uh, marketing folks at early stage startups happen to watch your podcast. Yeah, reach out. Cool. Yeah, we'll make sure to link the the URL in the in the notes. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's that's it, everyone. Thank you for being uh, for watching. And thank you, uh, Chad, for being on the show. Got just dropped another banger, our first banger on <laughs> Money Me. So we're super stoked about you being on for for that and for sharing your insights and your expertise with us. Well, I appreciate y'all having me on. Yeah. And before we go, we want to uh, thank everyone for tuning in to the Flow State channel and uh, going with us on this new kind of money me uh, episode type. Uh, your support means the world to us and just other creatives. It's been so fun to bring other creatives in to kind of talk about how we all get through this wild business uh, together. Um, if you enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay updated uh, and follow along for the latest conversations and episodes. Uh, We'll be back with more premium content on design and pricing. And uh, again, make sure you subscribe like right now uh, because you won't do it later uh, and share with uh, other creatives and friends if you would. Uh, So uh, thanks again. Uh, I think that's it for today.